I don't think it's an outlandish take to say Philip K. Dick is one of the most influential writers of the 20th century, producing over 40 novels and more than 100 short stories. It's a repertoire of works that few authors can match, and considering how popular and well regarded the man is nowadays, it's a shame that Dick spent most of his living years as an author toiling in relative obscurity, his works often misunderstood and considered too outlandish for most readers of his day. He was a man who wrote about the future, and ironically, a lot of his work wouldn't be appreciated until much later in the future. His big mainstream break was of course the movie adaptation of his 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. And while this movie is rightly considered one of the cornerstones of science fiction cinema, PKD unfortunately never got to see his creation on the big screen, tragically passing away only a few months before the release of the movie in 1982. Of course, similar to Dick's literary works, Blade Runner 2 took time to warm to the general public. It was released during a particularly busy time for sci-fi movies, going up against the likes of The Thing, Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan, and E.T. The Extraterrestrial, of all things. Man, 1982 was a good year for sci-fi movies, wasn't it? This meant Blade Runner wasn't really an immediate success, and for many years was considered somewhat of a cult hit amongst movie fans, slowly building its reputation over time. And even though it didn't strike it big immediately, what it did do was bring the eyes of Hollywood onto Dick's repertoire of works. And it may come as a surprise to you how many pieces of media have been based on or inspired by Dick's works over the years. Of course, we've got straight adaptations like The Man in the High Castle, Minority Report, and A Scanner Darkly, but movies like Screamers, The Adjustment Bureau, Next, which features prime bird hair Nick Cage, by the way, and my personal favourite, Total Recall, are also all based on the works of Philip K. Dick. It's clear to see that the man's influence wasn't just limited to the literary and sci-fi world, his effect on cinema and TV is nothing to be snuffed at either. Now most of Dick's major works have been adapted in some form over the years, but there's always been one major outlier, a novel that many would consider to be Dick's finest, a book called Ubik. Ubik was first published in 1969 and is a relatively short story coming in at just over 200 pages, but the amount that is being packed into those pages is simply astounding. It tells the tale of corporations in the future, utilising psychics to deal in espionage and sabotage, but it's really so much more than that. Ubik, in many ways, is like a book within a book. It covers themes surrounding technology, capitalism, life, death, religion, reincarnation, and questions the very idea of reality itself. It's, for lack of a better term, a masterpiece of science fiction. And it is also Dick's highest profile work to never receive a film adaptation. Some say it just can't be done, that the book doesn't lend itself well to a visual medium, that nobody could ever do the source material justice. Now, personally, I don't think this is the case. The book actually has an almost ideal structure for a movie, in my opinion, but for whatever reason, it's just never happened. Now that's not for a lack of trying. Dick himself was commissioned to write a screenplay of the novel back in 1974, which never got picked up in the end. But this screenplay is still in print nowadays and is an interesting curiosity in its own right. A look at what could have been. And over the years, many directors, including Richard Linklater, Michelle Gondry, and Terry Gilliam have all flirted with the idea of adapting the classic novel over to the big screen, but for one reason or another, they could just never follow through on it. Now, a big reason for this might be down to just how much the ideas and themes in Ubik have been used in other works throughout the years. Terry Gilliam, in a 2019 interview with ComingSoon.net stated, that's the problem. So much has been lifted from Ubik. It probably doesn't feel fresh anymore to an audience. I'm curious whether Dick would work better now or not. I just don't know anymore because so many films were made that took the best of Dick in them and played with them. And this is a very interesting point because when you look at some of the movies that took heavy inspiration from Ubik, we're talking movies like The Matrix and Inception, to name but a few. It's difficult to know if the time for Ubik has passed. Would it still be considered as fresh and original when so much of it has been taken and utilised across media which itself is now considered old really? It's hard to say. 
Now, the reason why I wanted to highlight all of this is because it's important to understand firstly how beloved and influential this book is, and secondly, how difficult it has been to successfully translate into a visual medium, not for a lack of trying. Because in spite of all this, Ubik did eventually see a soul adaptation, and probably in a form that you wouldn't expect. A video game. A 1998 release for the PC, made in France. Ah, oh, Jesus, no. Who keeps giving them these fucking licenses? So yeah, today we're taking a look at the Ubik video game, which comes from none other than our old friends at Cryo Interactive. Apparently France's favorite PKD book is Ubik, so it's no surprise that our favorite French dev team would somehow try to make a game out of it. Now, if you're wondering how a dev like Cryo keeps getting the go-ahead to make games based on all these odd licenses, you know, considering how their takes on an Aeon Flux and Virus game turned out, which as you may remember, were a uh, not good. Well, Cryo once upon a time made a little game for home computers called Dune, an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Sandy Worm book. And this Dune game turned out to be pretty good. And not only was it good, it was a massive commercial success as well, skyrocketing Cryo's reputation as a studio, not to mention their finances as well. To this day, many still consider Cryo's Dune to be the best Dune game ever made, although Westwood Interactive's Dune 2 is certainly a shoe in for that title as well. It did basically set the blueprint for all modern RTSs after all. Now even though Dune is a game that catapulted Cryo into the limelight, it's also been the game that's kind of carried them as a studio ever since. Sure they'd have a number of well regarded hits on home computers, but as time went on the quality of their games began to decline rapidly and dramatically. I suppose one way of looking at it is that the developers of probably the best Dune game ever made also managed to put out the worst Dune game ever made about 10 years later. If any of you out there have played Dune on the PS2, I am truly sorry you had to experience that. So yeah, the easy answer as to why Cryo kept getting these licenses was because they made a really good game based on a really good book, so you'd imagine if they could do it once, they'd probably be able to do it again. And this is where 1998's Ubik comes into play. Now, first things first, to set you up for this game, I'm going to show you an early trailer for it that came out a year before its eventual release in 1997, as this should give you a pretty good idea of the style of game that Ubik is. From the mind that brought you Blade Runner and Total Recall, based on the science fiction masterpiece by Philip K. Dick, comes an entirely new kind of challenge, Ubik. Colonies in space. And an ongoing war of industrial espionage. Gangs of greedy agents fight a vicious battle for information, control, and money. Using guns and explosives. And they can read your mind. Master your own psychic powers and choose your squad with care as you take on the brutal challenge of a strategy and adventure game that is both brawn and brains. Enjoy the thrill of real-time action created using motion capture on actual paramilitary fighters and set in a rich and haunting 3D universe of decline and decadence. Select your squad Evolve your character and balance mind power with firepower. But act fast. Trouble knows where you are. Philip K. Dix, Ubik. 
Alrighty, so that was the initial trailer for Ubik, and as you can see, the game itself is a hybrid of an adventure game, but also a squad-based tactics game. Not too unsimilar to the likes of Cannon Fodder, and probably its biggest inspiration, Bullfrog Cyberpunk Classic Syndicate. Only now we've got psychic powers, and the graphics are clearly much better. But, uh, you see, the thing is, this trailer right here, it's kind of like the infamous E3 trailer for Killzone 2 and that it looks great, but it uh, isn't really an accurate representation of the final product. Here is the trailer for Ubik, and this is what the final product actually looks like. Yeah, a little bit different to say the least. The game we got is basically the Wish.com version of what we saw in the trailer. Now, that's not to say it looks terrible by any means, it's just in comparison to the original footage, it's a definite step down. Now this footage we're looking at right now is from a channel called Twilight Adventures, which as far as I can tell is the only place on the internet that features a full playthrough of this game. Now, this of course is the original 1998 PC version of the game, but we aren't in the market of PC games on this channel. Oh no, we love ourselves some weird old PlayStation games, let me tell you. And when Cryo decides to port one of their games from the PC to the PlayStation, as we've seen in the past with the likes of Dreams and the Raven Project, the product that ends up on the PlayStation is often its own unique beast. A beast that should really be put out of its misery, if at all possible. Now Ubik here on the PC, uh, it certainly doesn't look like a game that would work very well on the PS1, right? A mouse-controlled squad-based shooter that's full of FMV cutscenes, high-res backgrounds, and voice dialogue that takes up a whopping three compact discs. Not a great candidate for a PS1 port, right? Well, Cryo has always been a studio that likes to dream big, and dream big they did. Ubik somehow managed to make its way to the PS1 as a PAL exclusive two years after its PC release in the year 2000, thanks to a little help from a frequent collaborator of Cryo's called Smart Dog Studios, and most surprisingly of all, it's actually a proper port of the PC version and not some weird PlayStation exclusive take on the game, albeit now cut from three discs down to a single lone PlayStation disc. Now what does this mean for the quality of the PlayStation game? Well, quite a lot really. If the PC version of Ubik was the Wish.com version of the original trailer, well then the PS1 version is the Wish.com version of the Wish.com version. A game that on first glance seems like quite possibly the most unwieldy and broken PS1 game in existence. And you know what? It might just be that. Ubik on the PS1 is a game that feels like it shouldn't exist, looks like it shouldn't exist, sounds like it shouldn't exist. I guess what I'm trying to say is that this thing shouldn't exist, but yet, here it is. Out of all the Cryo PS1 games, it's the one I feared playing the most, because every other Cryo game I've played, at least on the outside, looked like it could have been a fun game, even if inevitably, they all ended up being rather terrible once you took the time to dig into them. Ubik, on the other hand, from the second I seen it, looked like the worst playing game on the console. And not only that, this is the only Cryo game that I've actually seen make bad PS1 game lists. Cryo PS1 games are notorious for flying under the radar in complete obscurity in spite of their quality and I suppose meme ability, but this, this is apparently so bad, it's been noticed by the general public. And because of this, it makes the next point even more interesting. It's another game with no playthroughs available online. There is a single playthrough of the PC version, as we mentioned, but the PS1 version, uh, kind of a mystery really. So in my quest to complete and document every cryo game on the PS1, instead of prolonging the inevitable, I decided it was time to tackle the cryo game I feared the most and finally find out once and for all is Ubik the worst Cryo PS1 game? Or maybe, just maybe, are we actually sitting on some sort of misunderstood gem? I'll uh, let you guess which of the two it is. Now before I started this game, I needed to understand the source material, so the first thing I did was read through the book. Now, this was my first time reading Ubik by the way, and I absolutely loved it. It's one of those books that once it gets going, you really can't put down. And if there is anything you should take away from this video, 
It's that Ubik is absolutely 110% worth the read, a masterclass in science fiction, no doubt about it. Now, I kind of got the feeling that reading this book might have been a waste of time because when I watched the movie Virus in preparation for the Virus video game, it turned out the game had nothing to do with the source material and instead of fighting robot aliens on a boat, I was fighting Yakuza in a hotel for some reason. Well, as it turns out, this time it was quite the opposite. If I hadn't read Ubik, I would have had absolutely no idea what was going on in this game. To be honest, I still kind of have no idea what was going on in this game for a couple of reasons, but um, let's just say knowledge of the book is somewhat important to enjoy the story here, at least in the PS1 version anyway. So just a heads up, I will be talking about elements and plot points of the book during this video, and that means there will be some spoilers here too. Now to clarify, the book and the game actually take some very different turns plot-wise, I guess, but there are key moments that are shared across the game and book, so if you care about that sort of stuff and don't want any spoilers from a novel from 1969, just know that you've been warned. Now, even though the PS1 version of this game was published during the new logo era of Cryo Interactive, you know, the crap one, since the PC version of Ubik came out in 98, the game does still feature the classic Cryo space intro, and this right here is by far my favorite one yet, because we get this cool transition from the space logo into the opening movie, which features a character from the book called Ella Ronsider in something known as Cold Pack. Cold pack is essentially the process of freezing people who have recently passed away, but if they are frozen quick enough, it's possible to keep their brain activity in a state known as half-life, meaning under the right conditions, in this world, you can actually commune with the dead. We'll delve more into this process and the character of Ella Runciter in time, but for now, let's check out the rest of the opening sequence. My name's Joe Chip. I'm in charge of operations for Rumsitter Associates. An agent from the Hollis Corporation blew my conapt away, so now I live right here in my office in the Rumsitter building. Hollis specializes in information espionage. They use spies with highly developed psionic powers to infiltrate business corporations and steal secrets. My job is to find and neutralize the spies. To do that, I also use some psionics. A lot of people would say I'm old-fashioned, but I like to think we're the good guys. situation. Mr. Runciter would like to see you. I'll be right there. Fun phone hopes you had a fulfilling conversation, Mr. Ch so yeah, we're into the game. Not even a main menu to kick things off. The last game that did this to me was Tunguska and that, uh, well, let's just say that doesn't bode well. So Ubik takes place in the far off future of 2019. Now the book takes place in the far off future of 1992, but it's probably good that we understand right away that Ubik the game kind of takes a few liberties with the plot and characters of Ubik the book. So uh, pay no mind to any weird inconsistencies you are bound to see. This is our main character and protagonist, Joe Chip, a technician for Runciter Associates, which is known as a prudent organization. What is a prudence organization, you ask? Well, you see, in the future, some humans have basically awoken to the potential of psychic abilities. Size or precogs, as they are known, can have all sorts of powers, but the main thing to focus on for this story is that size can be used as agents to essentially spy on individuals, corporations, and governments, which, as you'd imagine, can cause a whole host of trouble. The most notable of these psi organizations is led by a man called Ray Hollis, and if you want to learn some dodgy information and have bucket loads of cash, well, you call Ray Hollis and get one of his agents on the job. Now, it may not come as a surprise that having folks who can telepathically read your thoughts is, uh, not great. So to counter this, there exists what's known as prudent organizations that essentially employ countersize known as inertials 
to nullify other psychics. So if you become aware of a Psy hanging around and listening in on your thoughts, contact a prudence organization, get some inertials out, and they'll basically balance things out until the problem just uh, goes away. Now, that might have been a pretty big dump of random terms and info there, but this is kind of important to know going forward, so uh, just roll with it for now. Now, normally, when it comes to cryo games, if possible, I like to walk people through the experience from start to finish to really get a full taste of the experience. But we're not going to be doing that today with Ubik because number one, it's really long, and number two, a lot of it will just be weird blocky characters, walking places, and the rest would probably be just loading times. And while it would be kind of funny to have a video that's just four hours of loading screens, something tells me that's not what passes for entertainment these days. So. Uh, we're not going to do that. So instead, we're just going to take a look at the package as a whole in bits and pieces, starting with the gameplay. Oh god, the gameplay. So, here's Ubik, and as you can see, it's, uh... Well, it's something. Now, as we all know by now, this is a PS1 port of a point-and-click game on the PC, meaning the controls are probably very cumbersome and, for lack of a better term, absolutely shite. Well, yes, they are, but guess what? This game actually has mouse support, although it requires both a PlayStation mouse and a separate controller plugged into the second port to play. Now, that seems like a lot of hassle, and since I also hate myself and enjoy suffering, we're gonna play this the OG way and just use a controller. Now, when I started this game, I tried to just wing it and pick things up as I went along. Now, the main things you should know is that you can select your party or individual characters using the shoulder buttons, and clicking on the screen with the X button will move your characters and make them interact with things. X kinda does everything. Walking, talking, looting, shooting, uh, whatever this is. Point and press X, and you're good to go. Now, there's a bit more to the movement and controls, but we'll get to that in a moment. For now, let's break down what you actually do in Ubik, which is basically clicking on shit a lot. So the game is broken up into several different missions, which feature three distinct phases. The briefing phase, the loadout phase, and the mission itself. The briefing part is pretty self-explanatory. You wander around the runs to their associates' offices and can talk to various characters to get information about the world and people that inhabit it. Once you talk with the right person to trigger the beginning of a mission, you then walk over to the squad selector panel, and then you'll move into the loadout phase. The loadout phase is where you pick your squad before you go on a mission. Now, in the PC version, you can have a party of up to five characters, but on the PS1, this is capped at a reduced number of four. You'll have some set characters that are mandatory to take with you on missions, but the rest you can choose from a pool of what's known as physicals and size. Physicals are more or less standard soldiers. They have no special powers, but they can use any type of weapon and armor available. Size, on the other hand, have access to special abilities like healing, cyballs, and shields, all that wacky shit. But as a drawback, they are also much squishier and more restricted on what weapons and armor they can equip. During this phase, you have a set budget to basically hire your team and arm them as you see fit. Now as the game goes on, you also get access to more specialized versions of physicals and size, things like snipers and medics, and folks with stronger psychic powers. You can even pay informants for info on the upcoming missions, giving you access to map layouts and other handy information too. It's Kind of cool, honestly. Your total cash budget does reset after each mission, so you might as well blow all your cash and give yourself the best possible chance for success each time. Or if you're just too lazy, you can hit the pre-select button and skip this whole part too, if you like. Once you're into the mission itself, you and your crew have to complete a set objective. Now, this could be killing all the enemies around the map, finding a particular person or object, or just doing whatever the hell this is. Either way, no matter your objective, most of the time all it involves is just exploring the map and engaging in combat with pretty much everybody you see. Now, I say everybody, but really everything in this game just kind of looks like a mashed up blob of pixels. So long story short, if you move your icon over the blob and it turns into a red crosshair, tap the X button until its life bar runs out or else it will most likely do the same to you. You generally just do this on repeat until the mission ends and then you reset and do it all over again. Briefing, loadout, mission. There you go. Now, if I'm being honest, as a concept, I actually quite like what the game's trying to do on a gameplay level. Curating a team of soldiers and psychics, loading them out to your personal tastes, and then utilizing them all to take on a mission for your anti-psychic organization is kind of cool, right? Well, it would be if the game itself wasn't 
broken beyond belief. Ubik might be the most botched game I have ever played. Part of this is down to some classic cryo game design, but a big part of this is also down to the quality of the PS1 port. In fact, a lot of it is down to the PS1 port. Let's go through a list of things that make Ubik a bad time all around, shall we? First off, the load times. Ubik has, without a doubt, the worst load times of any cryo game I've played, and cryo games as a whole already had some of the worst load times of any PS1 game in general. And not only that, the game frequently throws load screens at you, moving from screen to screen, instigating dialogue with a character, simply just clicking on things. You could get load screens lasting anywhere from 10 to 40 seconds. There were multiple times I thought the game had just froze up on me, but in fact, it was a loading screen that was apparently needed because I moved my character ever so slightly to the left. Now look, I personally can live with a few long load times. I'm not some SSD snob, I don't mind waiting a little while to get into my game. Hell, I could even deal with the loading shenanigans in Sonic 06. I didn't like it, but I dealt with it. But the loading in this game is so bad, I can't imagine anybody would deal with it beyond the opening level or two. Like, the only reason you could put up with this is if you were making a YouTube video for the enjoyment of others, which unfortunately means I just had to put up with it. Now let's just say you learn to live with the load times. The next issue you'll likely experience is how awful it is to simply move around in this game. So in Ubik, you move your characters through various static backgrounds. Now, you can change the camera angles in two ways, either by clicking on the edge of the screen when the cursor turns into a yellow arrow, or by enabling an automatic camera by pressing the triangle button. This function will automatically adjust the camera to an ideal angle as your character moves throughout an area. Now this whole system is absolutely terrible, specifically on the PS1 version, and that's down to a number of things. First off, since the PS1 version comes on a single disc as opposed to the PC version's three discs, it means that the number of static background angles has been reduced significantly, meaning rooms are smaller and laid out a whole lot more awkwardly. In the PC version, you can view a whole area from a top-down perspective, as well as to the left and to the right. In this version, you just can't do that, and it can often mean walking to the left means you end up in a completely new location or area that you just didn't want to be in. And not only does this make it almost impossible to simply walk to places that you want to go to, but it's also some of the most disorientating shit that I've ever seen in my life. Simply trying to make my characters move forward somehow changes the camera to a wide angle view behind you. Seriously, where, where am I? What am I even looking at here? Another reason this is worse than the PC edition is because in that game, you can access a minimap in the top right and simply move to the desired location by clicking on that. The map rotates, you can zoom in and out. It's a functional minimap. Who'd have thunk it? Now in the PS1 version, the minimap is still present in the top right corner, but not only can you no longer rotate it or zoom using it, but clicking on the map does absolutely nothing. No movement, nothing. Frankly, its only purpose in this version is to detect enemies in your vicinity, otherwise it only serves to disorientate you further, and the only real way that you can tell which direction you're going is by trial and error, or this little compass, and honestly, even the compass kinda sucks, so trial and error is your best friend here. So look, you gotta keep in mind, a huge part of this game is just simply moving around and navigating through these maps, and because the act of doing so is not only incredibly difficult and unenjoyable, but it's also filled with a myriad of long load times, well, clearly things aren't looking so hot for Ubik. But trust me, we've only just scratched the surface. The PS1 version is further broken in ways you couldn't possibly begin to imagine. Next, let's look at this utility wheel, which is brought up by pressing the circle button. Now take a look at these functions. What do you think these do? Now I for one couldn't tell by simply looking at them. I tried using them on enemies, my characters, NPCs, uh, pretty much everything really. The only function that seemed to work for my testing was the down and up arrows, which are for crouching, and uh, not crouching, respectively. Now, I checked the manual to see what these functions are, and supposedly, they're used to specify if you want to interact with, move to, speak, or engage in combat with an object or person. There are also functions for healing and psychic powers here too. Basically, they're shortcuts to designate specific actions. And you know what? That is exactly what these things do. 
in the PC version anyway, in the PS1 version, these functions just don't work. You can press them, but they literally don't do anything. If you move your cursor over something and press X, you'll interact with it in the only way that you can. So in one sense, you never need to use the shortcut menu in the PS1 version anyway. But another big reason for that is because they also removed everything that you could use the wheel to interact with. Objects in the environment, most of the NPCs, they're just not present in this version of the game. For example, during the briefing parts of this game, you have the option to wander around the runs to their associates offices, which features multiple floors of rooms filled with different areas. Now, in the PC version, these areas are filled with characters that you can interact with. In the PS1 version, these areas are completely empty. I checked every single area and there is not a soul to be found. This also took about 17 minutes to do by the way and that's in game time too which stops whenever it's loading so it was probably closer to 30 minutes. And yes I am wasting my life by the way how did you know? So basically the PS1 version is just outright missing features and content from the PC version but they also left in stuff that just doesn't work or function as intended. Now you might think I'm just playing it wrong but let's look at another instance of this in action, why don't we? So, when you're arming your squad, one of the things you can buy for them is ammo for your weapons. Now, in the PC version, ammo is needed for your weapons. You want to fire your gun? Well, you're going to need some ammo. If you run out of ammo, well then you can't use them. What a concept, right? Well, in the PS1 version, you can buy ammo, but the guns in this game just don't use them. There's no ammo counter, the ammo in my inventory doesn't disappear, it's just something that's left in the game but serves absolutely no purpose. Enemies drop ammo when they die, but all you can do is pick it up and sell it later, which, by the way, since we're talking about items, you uh, can't really use in this game either. Kinda. So items that you pick up, right? You'd imagine you could equip to your characters, well, you can't. You can pick up armor, but there's actually no way to equip it. The only way that you can equip armor to your characters in this version of the game is to hit the specific button when purchasing it in the shop. I guess the idea originally was that you could drag and drop items and armor from your character's inventory to your equipment slots, but would you believe it? This also just doesn't work in the PS1 version, so armor, weapons, you name it, are completely useless in your inventory unless they're equipped at the time of purchase. If they ever end up in your inventory, the only thing that you can do with them is sell them, really. In fact, the only items you can even use are medkits, which is thanks to the dedicated heal button on the UI. Honestly, if this button was broken, the entire game would probably be unbeatable, so I'm glad they at least got this working. And I suppose speaking of equipping characters, your squad in this game, I'll just let you know now, psychics, are almost entirely useless. Yes, they have powers and yes, they can give you shields and fire weird little energy balls, but none of that matters because they will just die to gunfire every single time. They're just too squishy and weak to be of any use in this game. Sure, you can give them commands to use specific powers by clicking on these weird symbols in the UI, but no power in this game compares to a bunch of physicals with good guns and armor who just steamroll enemies, whereas the best psychics will just get steamrolled by the enemies because they're too squishy. There's quite literally no reason to ever use psychics in this game. Just pick the best physicals and arm them with the best available weapons and armor, and there you go, that's pretty much all you'll ever need. You are stuck with one psychic on your team by default anyway, called Pat Conley, who is a permanent fixture on your squad after the first mission, and she does have the only useful psychic ability, which is healing, but other than that, you'll never need another. It's kind of a shame that one of the big draws of this game, the psychic combat, is so botched, but then again, this is still the least of the game's issues. So let's see, the load times, bad. The controls, bad. Game's missing a ton of stuff, which is bad, and combat and squad stuff, also bad. Well, how about the missions? They're bad. <laughs> So as I mentioned before, a lot of the gameplay in this is just clicking around a map until you've clicked enough stuff that you beat the mission. Now the difficulty in this should likely come from exploration and enemy encounters, but truthfully most of the combat in this game is quite easy, assuming you are at a good angle to instigate said combat. The difficulty in Ubik actually comes from simply moving around the map. From start to finish, 
You will be fighting to get your team where you want them to go. Sometimes they'll wander off somewhere new, they might get stuck in a doorway, or you could spend ages on a screen simply just looking for where the exit is, which can sometimes feel like a hidden object game. Once you do eventually get to combat, victory kind of comes down to whoever sees who first. If you see an enemy, click on them and hopefully they should die. Now I say hopefully because sometimes your team just won't fire or invisible objects get in the way and enemies just won't take damage. In fact, most of my deaths in this game came from being shot off screen. And as we mentioned, trying to align the screen in the right way to see said enemies, it's uh, easier said than done. By the way, if either of the two main characters, Joe or Pat, die, it is an instant game over, which sends you back to the beginning of the mission. And not just the mission, the briefing part of the mission. So you gotta do the briefing part, the loadout part, and then get back to the mission itself, which is a uh, not great. Now thankfully dying isn't too much of a problem because you can at the very least save anywhere at any time, but still, dying thanks to being unable to see things or just stuff not working, uh, not ideal. Now every mission in the game shares these common issues, and there's about 15 or so in total, but certain missions are more interesting and uh, much worse than others, so let's highlight a few of them, shall we? Now the first three missions in this game are pretty straightforward, just walk around and kill some dudes. They're not good per se, but they are easy enough at least. Now prior to doing the second mission, during the briefing phase, I did that whole walk around the office building thing. You know, the waste of time that took 30 minutes. Well, guess what the fourth mission is? You gotta walk around the whole of the office building all over again, only this time, you've got to hunt down a bunch of enemy size who've invaded the place. This once again took over a half hour to do because not only do you have to visit every single floor of the building, but you've got to visit some floors multiple times because enemies just happen to respawn there. It was the fucking worst. Now the mission after this is probably one of the most interesting in the game because this is kind of where the story begins to intersect with the book. One of the most pivotal moments in the book is when a squad of inertials along with your boss Glenn Runciter, the CEO of Runciter Associates, go to the moon and to my surprise it featured a cutscene of probably the most memorable scene from the book where you get ambushed by a living bomb that ends up floating up in the air before exploding and killing Glenn Runciter. I was really curious how they might have interpreted that visually, and honestly I think Cryo did a pretty good job with this, it's probably my favourite thing in the whole game really. Well, since this bomb ends up killing your boss, our mission is now to race against the clock to get him back to your ship and put him into cold pack before his brain activity ceases, so you can do the whole Half-Life thing, if you remember that from all the way back in the opening movie. Ella is Glenn Runciter's wife by the way, will uh, See more of her in a bit. So this whole level involves you escaping from the moon base with your boss who is in a floating casket that follows behind you. I kind of love this, not gonna lie. Well, in the PC version, this mission has a time limit, a bunch of enemies to get by, and a maze to navigate to get out on time. In the PS1 version, there is no time limit, the map is much smaller, and almost all of the enemies have been removed. So 90% of this mission is just walking. Lots and lots of walking. And also, I genuinely thought I got stuck at some point in this level, because if you wander into this area, there's a hole, and going into this hole kept spinning me out the way I came in. Now, I ain't gonna lie, I was stuck here for about 20 minutes just wondering what the hell I was doing wrong. Now, it turns out in the PC version, there's an elevator here that brings you up to the next level of the moon base. In the PS1 version, there's no elevator, just a hole where the elevator should be. So the solution is that walking in here basically just plops you up at the top of the next section, bypassing the whole elevator thing. And instead of clicking on the hole like I've been doing the whole time, I should have clicked on the exit, which my brain convinced me was 100% the way that I had just came in, but in fact was actually the way to progress forward. I hate this game so much. Now the next mission involves some guys getting onto your transport back to Earth and hacking the ship, so you gotta kill all these dudes and then play this one-off cyberspace minigame, which uh, Joe, my man, are you doing okay? Now this puzzle involves you guessing a four-digit number. It's pure trial and error, but at the very least, once you get a number correct, it stays highlighted in red. Now the problem is that every time you guess wrong, you've also got to sit through this unskippable cyberspace cutscene that lasts about 10 seconds. This game actively wants to make you miserable, and let me tell you, it does a great job. Once you eventually get the code, you just gotta walk around and shoot this, uh, 
enemy, I guess. And there you go, mission complete. Now the mission after this, you finally get your boss into coal pack in a place called a Mematorium, which is where the deceased are kept in storage for future communications. Seriously, the game doesn't do any of this stuff justice, trust me, it, it is wild. Anyway, the job here is to protect the casket from a bunch of Saigoons who have shown up to take out your boss. This is another kind of easy level, but if you click on the wrong part of the screen, you can end up in completely weird and out of focus places that'll likely get you killed because enemies will just shoot you from off screen. But if you stand at one place and let the waves of enemies just run into you, it turns out that's a much better way to do things. Now, I want to let you know the whole briefing and loadout part of the game, that's been absent during the previous few missions. Obviously, since we're not at our home base and have been traveling to and from the moon, we can't really do that stuff. Well, I just want to highlight this because pretty soon that whole aspect of the game just kind of vanishes. Whoever is in your team, whatever your equipment is, uh, that's it for the entire rest of the game. So uh, prep up as soon as you can. And would you believe our next opportunity to do that just so happens to be our next mission, which once again takes place in the Runsider Associates office building, where we once again have a mission where we need to go through every single floor of the office and kill a bunch of enemies one by one. None of these office combat scenes happen in the book, by the way. Cryo just really wanted you to do this a few times for fun. Thankfully, this time you only have to visit each floor once, and after knowing my way around this place like the back of my hand, it only took about 10 minutes to get through this time. So from here on out, every mission in the game no longer lets you change equipment or members, so I hope you picked a good team. Also, the game now takes place in the past, uh, the 1930s to be exact. I'll explain a bit more about that shortly, but hey, it's time to take a flight on a Zeppelin. Now this Zeppelin mission, I probably died on more than any other because getting this screen to face in the direction you want to hear, uh, almost impossible and enemies keep on popping at it everywhere and killing your team while they're off screen, so that's nice. The goal here is just to restart four engines on the Zeppelin because it's apparently statically floating in the sky, I guess. Honestly, once you make it past the opening part of this mission, it ain't too bad, but my god, the first minute or so, oof. Okay, once we land, this is where the game really begins to take the piss. The final group of missions in this game take place in different areas across 1930s Des Moines, Iowa. There are four locations, the airfield, the beloved Brethren Memorial, the hotel, and the streets of Des Moines. These four locations, you are gonna flip flop from back and forth for the entire rest of the game. Each time you go to one of these locations, you're gonna have to kill a bunch of enemies that all spawn in the exact same locations each time with more terrible camera angles and locations to explore. And it just keeps going and going and going to the point that you almost think the game is playing a cruel joke on you. And the progression here can be rather obtuse as well. There's a part where to trigger the next mission, you've gotta go into the hotel, leave the hotel, kill everybody on the street, go into the hotel again, kill everybody in the hotel, talk to a guy, leave the hotel, and then kill everybody on the street again. And that's the mission. And then when the next mission begins, you once again start in the hotel, and you've got to do it all over again. What is happening? Also, there's one part in particular where I was about to lose my freaking mind because in a mission that takes place inside the Memorial, you've got to read a Book of the Dead to progress through the level. And when you click on it, you'll see this cutscene. You see your name and Pat's name, and then the game freezes. I thought this was another long load screen, but nope, the game actually softlocks here. Now, you may remember when I played through another cryo game on the PS1 called The Raven Project, that the game softlocked during the ending cutscene, preventing me from ever seeing the resolution to that masterpiece of video game storytelling. Well, in Ubik, I still had more of the game to get through, and I thought this might actually be the end of the line for me. After all this fucking effort, and I hit this roadblock right near the very end of the thing. I was about ready to do a sad Charlie Brown walk right into the ocean, but thankfully, by some saving grace, I found if you talk to a specific character right before you activated the Book of the Dead, then it doesn't softlock and you can proceed with the game. Now, I don't know if this was just my disc or if every version of the game is like that, but hey, we get to move forward. Now, even though we got past that, I was constantly on edge, thinking the game might just fall apart and begin degrading at any time. Is this game even beatable? Well, I was determined to find out. Now before we answer that question, let's finally take a brief moment to talk about the presentation. It is shockingly bad.
The game has obviously been adjusted a bit to cater to the PS1, from the UI to the backgrounds and the character models, and all of it is some of the worst stuff that you will find on the console. Like, I don't think I will ever get over how dumb the walking animations in this game are. I mean, look at these guys go. A crack team of psychic killers right there. I have no idea how all of this stuff turned out so bad. Like, this is the worst any cryo game has looked. Even when trying to save space to fit the game onto a single disc, surely it could have turned out better than this. Anything would have been better than this. As for the music and sound, well, all the weird classic cryo sound effects are here. Seriously, every cryo game shares the same five sound effects. It doesn't matter the game or the genre, they'll fit them all in. Don't you worry. This game also has about three or four music tracks in total that loop endlessly across the different missions, some of which are fine. Others are classic cryo bangers that feature copious amounts of screaming and wailing as is tradition. Seriously, it really ain't a cryo game if somebody isn't expressing pain through song. The game does feature voice acting, which ain't too bad honestly. Some of the voices sound a little echoey, but for the most part it's, you know, passable, which on a scale to the rest of the game probably means it is the best thing here. Ubik, would that be your name sir? Ah, Mr. Chip! There's a party in the lounge area who wants to see you. He didn't give his name. Maintenance man, Mr. C, he's clean. Mr. Ashwood checked him out. He's updating the computers. No. The recruitment fee wasn't enough. And there was stuff in the contract about replacing bits of me with cybernetic implants. Actually, you know what? The real best thing in this game are the cutscenes. Now, since these were lifted from the vastly superior PC version, the quality here is pretty good. I do like seeing the different locations, characters and modes of transport between the missions. A lot of these do tend to repeat depending on the mission at hand, but they all tend to be pretty decent quality for a 98 release. And seeing some of the scenes in the book played out like this was kind of a treat really. Although the thing with the cutscenes is that once again, due to the conversion over to the PS1, a lot of the cutscenes are just outright missing from this game. And I mean, a lot. Specifically, stuff involving characters and story. Like, you'd be introduced to a character in the PC version and you'd get these cool little cutscenes to set things up, but they just aren't in this version of the game at all. Not only is this disappointing for obvious reasons, but on top of that, I also think this just kind of botches the story in this game as well. So here's where I'm going to delve into a few spoilers from the book, because Ubik on PS1 quite literally doesn't make any sense. Now Ubik on the PC takes a lot of liberties with the story. It adds new parts, changes a lot of existing stuff, and is basically its own take on the story, really. I mean, in the game, Runsider Associates is kind of like a paramilitary who sends people out to like murder psychics and gunfights, which uh, isn't really in the book. But even so, a lot of the major parts still take place. The bomb on the moon base, Runsitter dying and going to Cold Pack, the regression of time back to the 1930s, and the whole ending part in the mines that involves you communicating with both a dead Glenn Runsitter and his wife Ella, as well as another character called Jory, who is the main antagonist of the story. Now, I can't fully say how well this all turns out in the PC version, other than to say it's certainly a weird cryo take on the story that has been changed to cater to it being a video game, but on the PS1, it genuinely feels like stuff is just 
outright missing. The game often references characters, objects or events out of the blue that have never been mentioned or brought up before in game. You'll be in a conversation with somebody about a pivotal character and in the three hours that you played it, this is the first time that this character has been brought up. I talked to every NPC, went through every piece of dialogue and tried to get as much info as I could in game and I don't think there was ever an explanation as to why we went back in time, why Joe and Pat Conley's names were in the Book of the Dead, why a dead Runciter was talking to us, or why Ubik, the whole thing the book is about, is even a thing. It just shows up at one point and they're like, hey look, it's Ubik. You guys know Ubik, right? It's the name of the game, why wouldn't you? It was as if I had blacked out multiple times while playing the game and woke up hours later and everything had just passed me by. Now it is very possible that I could have legitimately blacked out while playing this game, but I watched the footage back and nope, stuff just never gets brought up. Now this could very well be an issue with the script, I wouldn't put it past Cryo to be honest, but honestly I think this comes down to the cutscenes and characters just being removed from certain parts of the game on the PS1 version. You see, reading the book prior to playing the game, you know why this stuff happens, the game makes things confusing and changes a lot of stuff, but you still understand where you're going and why you're doing it. Uh, kind of. On the other hand, if you didn't read the book prior to playing this game, this would probably be the most incoherent mess of a video game you'll have ever played. The gameplay, the presentation, the story, Everything here is just a disaster of catastrophic proportions. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, let's see the end of the game. So remember the whole bit where I had to go to the airfield, hotel, streets and memetorium a whole bunch? Well, guess what? You gotta do that some more, because why the fuck wouldn't you? This time though, you've gotta fight a few boss enemies. The master psychic, Estol Melipone, basically the head psychic of the Hollis organization, and also Jory, who I swear gets brought up like once in this game, despite being so pivotal to the story, but hell, here he is. The bosses are normal enemies with larger health bars by the way, so the fights are clearly riveting. Anyway, once you kill all the enemies across each of the maps again for, I don't know, the fifth time now, you beat the final mission and uh, Wait, no, there's somehow another mission. Of course there is. Thankfully, in this mission, all you gotta do is walk and talk to Ella Ronsider, who has now spawned here in physical form. Hello, Joe! So remember Ella in Cold Pack all the way back at the beginning, where she's, uh, dead? Well, if you didn't get it by now, you and all your playable characters, they're also actually dead. The reason why you're in the past is because that bomb blast all the way back yeah, it killed you, and not Runcither the whole time. You've actually been experiencing life in Half-Life yourself, and the reason time is regressing backwards is cause this character Jory has essentially been eating your life essence, almost like a time vampire. Pretty wild, I know. So you and Ella talk about your new purpose, which is to fight off all the Joris that exist in the Half-Life world, using a mystical creation of Ella's called Ubik, which gives you protection from the Joris. And once Ella tells you her time in this world is finishing up because she's about to properly die once and for all, well then we get this cutscene. Well, that's Ubik on the PS1, and let me tell you, I hated this game. Now look, I come into every single game I play with the intention of liking it, whether it's a weird obscure title, a game everybody on the internet tells me is terrible, or even cryo games. I want to give them all a fair shot and see what I personally think, because a lot of games people tell me are bad, I often quite enjoy actually for one reason or another. So. I figure it's always best to experience things on your own terms, but seriously, this might just be the least I've ever enjoyed playing a game, at least one that I've played to completion. I understand why there isn't a single playthrough of the PS1 version of this game online, because it is an arduous, long, drawn out process filled with nothing but pure, unadulterated video game misery. Any sane person 
would play this game for 10 minutes and go, Oh, I'm not having this. I'm what not having what? this. What's no, 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 What's no, 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 no. Look, I can appreciate that the PC version of this game is a deeply flawed mess, but truthfully, even though that version likely doesn't hold up very well today, it is quintessential cryojank, a game that's overly ambitious and experimental that was just beyond Cryo's capabilities as a studio. Maybe it's not very good, but I can still give them props for trying something new and interesting, but the PS1 port of that game outright should not exist. In typical Cryo fashion, its PS1 output takes whatever redeeming qualities their PC games have, puts it through a blender, and regurgitates it out the other side. This is quite possibly the worst port I have ever seen of a game, and if I'm being completely honest, I genuinely think this is the worst PS1 game, just purely based on how botched it is from head to toe. They should have never put this out to market, and frankly, it's an absolute disgrace to its source material. And you know, one of the funniest things about it all is this piece of text from the beginning of the manual where it asks what Philip K. Dick would have done if somebody handed him this game, and it says he would have played it. He would have been absolutely delighted at the ultimate Dickian reality game, the author collaborating in the creation of a virtual reality with a virtual version of himself. And you know what? After playing this thing, this might actually be the most disrespectful thing ever written about Philip K. Dick. Anyway, that's my thoughts on Ubik, and I don't know if you could tell, but this was possibly the most difficult game I've ever had to cover on this channel. Not only was it arduous to get through, but even writing about it was hard because there were so, so many issues to cover. It almost fogs your brain when thinking about it. And really, when you go from reading Ubik the book, which is such an enjoyable experience, to diving right into this thing, you kind of almost feel hollow after it. So if the structure of this review and the video as a whole is kind of messy, uh, I'm sorry. The fact anything even came out of my playthrough of this thing at all is kind of a miracle if I'm being honest, so uh, there you go. What I will say though, is please don't let this game turn you off from reading Ubik. The one positive I can take away from this experience was my love of the book itself, and that's something that I will carry with me forever while my playthrough of Ubik the PS1 game, well I have this video I suppose, and also some footage of my cats getting bored of the game and sniffing the box, so that's cute I guess. Anyway, this certainly isn't the end of my Cryo PS1 Chronicles, but like I said, at least this is likely the worst of the bunch out of the way and put to bed. Surely it can't get any worse than this. Surely. Can't believe a game would actually make me miss Pax Corpus, but hey, there you go. Of course, before we finish up, I'd like to give a big thank you to my very generous patrons whose kind support gives me the energy to make it true. Such horrible gaming experiences. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Alan Castlin, Crimson Cyclist, Dave Nolan, Doma, Globe99, Carl Winter, Moomatron, Moomin Biscuit, Trans Rights, Our Human Rights, and Richard Kramer, who all subscribe at the Fan++ tier. And of course, a big thank you to each and every one of you who takes the time to watch these videos. I'll be back real soon with hopefully some good video games this time around, but until then, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and for the love of God, Stay away from Ubik on the PS1. See ya.